His commitment to revival has caught the attention of all of us. Preaching at our conferences, our camps, and our churches, he has ignited a new hope and vision. And because of his vision, we are believing God together, praying together, planning together, and working together. God called Jack Cunningham from a great revival church in Newport News, Virginia, that he started to direct our home missions division, and from this position of influence, a strong evangelistic thrust is gaining tremendous momentum. As he comes to deliver the burden that he brings to this service, let us open our hearts to the challenge. How many are willing to do that as Brother Jack Cunningham comes? I want us to clap our hands to the Lord with all of our might. Let's lift him up in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We lift you up, Lord Jesus. We lift you up, Lord Jesus. There is a tremendous touch of the Holy Ghost on this meeting. It has already been said by several speakers that have come to this podium that this is like no other because of the times that we've enjoyed before. I don't believe because it's any better planned or because there has been any more prayer put into it. We have always come to because of the times and enjoyed the prayer foundation and support of this great church for this meeting. I don't believe it's because the speakers are any better. I don't believe because the location or any of those things. I believe with all of my heart that God Almighty has declared that this is our time, Pentecostals. This is our time. In Jesus name church I believe this is our day and God Almighty is trying to get that through to us thank you brother Anthony Mangan and all of your committee that puts this great conference together this conference is innovative this conference is cutting edge and I appreciate it so very much thank you for having the faith and the foresight to bring John Maxwell to us thank you brother Mangan the home missions division very very happy to stand with you on that we had 35 of our home missions directors here for that meeting and I, I appreciate brother Mangan taking the lead on that thank you also brother Mangan for bringing brother Bembry to us this morning to preach to us what a message we heard from God what a message Brother Bembry represents thousands of Afro-American constituents we now have in the United Pentecostal Church International. If you ever have an opportunity to visit the Black Evangelism Conference, this year will be held in New Orleans, Louisiana in the month of August. You need to go. Some of the greatest preaching and absolutely some of the greatest worship and singing you'll ever be a part of in your life will be there. I'm so thankful that I belong to the United Pentecostal Church that under understands that this message is for every race, every color, every creed, every language, every nation. Can you say amen? The Home Missions Division is right now working with 21 different language groups. We are having church with 21 different language groups and over 30 cultures right here in North America. That ought to thrill your heart that the church is reaching so many different people. I heard an old preacher on the radio, I believe he was a black preacher, and he was preaching on the radio and made the statement, he said, if you can't get along down here, how are you going to get along over there? Well, that's not right. The scripture really teaches if you don't get along down here, honey, you ain't going over there. And I like what I have felt in this conference I am so thankful, so very, very thankful. Every preacher that has got up to preach, you have stirred my heart, left me with my face in the seat, weeping and crying and asking God to help me. Brother Mangan last night, Brother Anthony Mangan set the pace for this meeting. I thank God for Anthony Mangan. I have always enjoyed his preaching. I've always thought he was capable. 
but I told my uncle last night at the end of the service, I saw and felt something on Anthony Mangan last night that I've never felt before. There's a very, very, very special touch of the Holy Ghost on you, Brother Mangan. This man has prayed hours for this meeting so that you and I would receive and enjoy. I wonder if you could raise a hand toward him and ask God to strengthen him and keep him. We need voices like this in this day. Would you do it? Father, I thank you for Brother Anthony. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing through his life. We need to hear his voice. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I want to give honor to Brother Kilgore, our Assistant General Superintendent. Brother Urshan and Brother Williams, as you know, had to leave because of World Conference. They, in fact, have to be at the World Conference. Brother Urshan will leave tomorrow on Thursday to go on to Athens to be there this weekend uh, ahead of the rest of us. But I appreciate the message our superintendent brought us last night. I want to go on record. I'm one God, apostolic, tongue-talking, holy rolling. Praise God. I believe this message God's give us. Sister Mangan, Brother Kilgore, Brother Bembry, all the preachers that have preached, thank you so very, very, very much. In your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. If I was interested in politics, I'd preach the second sermon to you that I brought in my book today. What I'm going to preach to you may be political suicide, if there's any such thing. But I've got a message from God if I've ever had a message in my life from God. There's something happening in our church. Do you feel it? I said something's happening and it feels good. Put both hands in the air, will you, real quick. Real quick. Father, we're thankful. We're thankful for what you're doing. We're thankful for what you're doing. Thank you, Jesus. In the book of Numbers chapter 13, if you're standing by someone that doesn't have a Bible, share with them. Beginning in verse number 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler, among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. Verse 26 says, And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Canaan and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land where thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Verse 31 said, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Verse 33, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 1 says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. When they asked me what title to put on this tape so they could go ahead and pre-print labels, I guess, I thought if I was going to use a title that would be proper English, I'd say, what is the message? Or what are you going to tell them? But because I'm from Virginia, I'm just going to title this, what you going to tell them? 
what you're going to tell them. Our church is standing at the most critical juncture in the history of the Jesus Name movement. And somehow, in Because of the Times, 1995, we have to settle what we're going to tell them when we go home from this meeting. Let's bow our heads. Brother Cole, would you come? And I want you to pray for us. I thank you for the holy presence of God that is in this place. I thank you for the holy anointing that is upon Brother Cunningham to speak to us today. I thank you for the holy anointing that is upon each of us. Touch us, O Lord, that we may hear your voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you clap your hands again before you're seated? Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. For the sake of time, I will not go into detail. You know the story of how that God miraculously led the children of Israel out of Egypt toward the promised land. You know the story of how that Moses and Aaron went in before Pharaoh more than three times and said, let my people go. And finally God sent the plagues, plague after plague, until finally the heart of Pharaoh was broken because of the death of his eldest son to the point that he opened the gate and told the people, of Israel to go ahead and leave Egypt and follow after your God. You know the story of how that God brought them to the Red Sea. There is a mountain on either side and Pharaoh's changed his mind and now his army is in hot pursuit of the Israelite people. And at night the Bible said Moses stretched his rod out over the sea and a wind blew through that night and when they awoke in the morning that sea had stood back and and it made a path for the children of Israel to walk across on dry ground. You know how God led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God was with His people. God was definitely in charge. God was most assuredly leading them toward this promised land. And the Bible would have us know that when they arrived at Jordan, just across the river from the land that God had promise to them that God spoke to Moses and said choose out 12 men notice in the scripture if you will he said a leader from each of the 12 tribes of Israel and let those 12 men as spies go into the promised land and let them spy out the bounty and the blessings that I have promised you and come again and report to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation the Bible said that that these 12 spies found the land full of bounty just as God had promised it to them. God had said it was a land flowing with milk and honey and that's what the spies found. He said there were walled cities and houses that you did not build. I'm going to give it to you, God said. And that's exactly, Brother Barnes, what the spies found in that land. He talked about streams of water. He talks about the beauty and the cool of the day. He talked about vineyards and more. It was all just like God told them it would be. After spying out the land for many days, they returned to report to Moses and Aaron. Two of the twelve returned with a positive report, but ten of the twelve came back with a negative report. And as these twelve spies are telling Moses and Aaron and the leaders of Israel what they found and what they saw in that land, the Bible would have us to know that all the people of Israel began to gather together. All of that band of Israel Israelites began to congregate. They wanted to hear the report. They wanted to see the fruit of the land that had been brought back by this band of 12 spies. As you read the story, you find that Joshua and Caleb are overtaken with excitement. These are young men that are so full of faith and so full of belief in what God had promised them that it's just bubbling over within them. They scream to the people, it's everything that God said it was. It was Caleb that made the statement, we came into the land. Whither thou 
sentence us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and then he points to two men that's with them that on a pole across their shoulders is one cluster of grapes and he said look there's the fruit of it that's an example of what this land is full of oh I don't know how you feel tonight but I'm thankful for men of God in our fellowship and women of God in our fellowship that can look beyond the dark times and look beyond the negativism and look beyond the devastation of our generation and they can say this is our day this is our hour this is our time our God is in charge this was Caleb and Joshua overtaken with excitement and the Bible said that Caleb stilled the people everybody said Caleb stilled the people read it in your Bible Caleb stilled the people before Moses and Caleb said let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overtake the land or to overcome it there was a strange hush that filled that congregation there was an anticipation that settled in the hearts and the minds and upon those that were gathered there literally thousands of men and women stood with bated breath expecting to receive their marching orders from Moses they fully expected men of God to say roll up your pant leg men we're going to wade in the Jordan we're fixing to go take the land that God's give us the Bible said that Caleb stilled the people so Moses could speak. Be Moses for me for a minute. Caleb standing there and everybody be quiet. Don't anybody say a word. Moses is fixing to speak to us. It's time for us to go and possess the land. We're well able to overcome it. Now everybody be quiet. Moses is fixing to talk to us. Moses is going to tell us where we ought to go from here. But the Bible lets us know that before Moses ever got a chance to say one single word, before the man of God ever got to open his mouth up that other ten began to pour out their negativism and pour out their unbelief and pour out their lack of faith <laughs> Caleb stilled the people so Moses could hear them but Moses never got to say a word the other ten begin to talk. You read it in the scripture. They said all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. They went on and said, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And then probably the most faithless statement in the Bible. Those men in the last verse of chapter 13 said, We were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. What negativism. The people's waiting to hear from Moses. Caleb's waved his arms and said, Everybody be quiet. The man of God's fixing to tell us where to go from here. The man of God's fixing to give us direction. But before he can lift his voice, there is this throng of negative witnesses, ten to two if you please, that lift their voice and say, It's not time. We can't do it. The giants are too great in the land. Oh God, after those ten spies gave their negative report, read it in your Bible, a spirit of oppression settled upon the people. Moses couldn't say a word. The man of God is shut up by the negativism of ten. And a spirit of depression and oppression hang over the people. And in Numbers 14 and 1 it says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And they wept all that night. All you could hear in the camp of Israel coming from the tents of Israel was the weeping and the wailing and the moaning it wasn't a shout of victory it wasn't rejoicing it wasn't even intercessory prayer sister Mangan it was the wail of defeat it was the it was the weeping and the wailing and the crying of we're not able the leadership told us we can't do it somebody said it can't be done we've got to listen to them they wanted to go but the ten said no we're not ready to go across yet I present to you that that night Israel lost faith in what God was doing for them. 
I present to you that that night they forgot all the promises that God had given them concerning the land of Canaan. I present to you that that night the negative report focused on the giants in the land instead of on God who had already given them the land and they lost all their faith and belief in the fact that God said I'm going to give it to you. That night Israel's hearts were stricken with fear and the Bible said they cried all night long. The results, was, the results were staggering because they believed the negative report. You hear what I'm telling you? Because they believed the negative report. Israel did a U-turn and they went wandering into the wilderness. They wandered for 40 years until every negative, unbelieving, and fearful Israelite was dead. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I'm telling you they wondered until every human being standing there had died save Caleb and Joshua. Until every one of them was dead and buried in the ground. God let them wonder. Not one person standing there was alive when Israel came back to Jordan again. All because, you hear me, all because of the negative voice, all because of the negative report, all because of the unbelief, all because that ten would destroy the hopes and the faith of God's elect. As leaders... I'm talking to pastors, I'm talking to evangelists, I'm talking to men and women of God, and I'm very aware of that. I'm talking to district superintendents that I would give my life for you. I respect you, I honor you. I'm talking to men of esteem and leadership in our fellowship, and I mean no disrespect in what I say, but as leaders of the great United Pentecostal Church, we're going to have to become conscious again of what we tell God's people is happening in our world it's time for you and I to stand up and declare if God said it he's going to do it in this conference I've walked around with young men and women that are here preachers and pastors and evangelists that are in this room right now I talked to a pastor and his wife brother Mangan that are in this conference that got in their car Sunday night after church and they drove 22 hours to get to this conference I talked to pastors who filled up a van on the east coast and they drove 24 hours to get to this conference I talked to one pastor and wife you talking about something that'll rip your heart out a home missionary on the east coast that wanted to be in because of the time so bad that they put their washer and dryer in the green pages of their newspaper and sold the washer and dryer so they could come to because of times I wonder how many would flip their hand up real quick and say, Preacher, I spent over a thousand bucks to get here this week. Would you hold your hand up? How many spent a thousand dollars this week? Wave your hand. Come on. How many spent over 500 this week to be here? Wave your hand. How many of you drove hours to get to this because of the time? Wave your hand, will you? I don't know what that does to all the other speakers, but Brother Mangan in my room last night, my wife can tell you, tears streamed down my face. And I said, God, when these people come in here, don't let me preach to them about how dark the day is. Don't let me tell them there's giants in the land. Don't let me tell them it can't be done. But somehow let me put it in them that this is our day it's our time it's our hour oh god oh my god sit down let me tell you something pastor when you go back to your local church this weekend your people have not had the benefit of being in because of the times they're going to gather in your little church on Sunday morning and they want to hear from God that's why they get up and shave their face and brush the teeth and put on a suit of clothes and put the family in the car and head for the house of God they want to hear from God (laughs) 
I want to know pastor. I want to know evangelist. I want to hit you right between the eyes. What are you going to tell them? What's your message going to be this coming Sunday morning? What are you going to say when you get in the pulpit? What spirit are you going to take home from because of the times? What's going to happen to you this week that's going to make you a different man? What's going to happen to you this week that's going to make you a different pastor? What is it that when you go to the pulpit, Brother Anthony, I don't mean no disrespect. I've told you a hundred times you're one of my favorite preachers. But when you came to the pulpit last night, something hit my heart. There's a new man preaching in this pulpit. This isn't the same Anthony Mangan I've always heard. He's crawled away and got a hold of something for God and your church has got to feel that way your church has got to see that on you your church has got to know when you come to the pulpit that you've been away with God like brother Kilgore preached to us it cannot it must not be business as usual any longer in the United Pentecostal Church John Maxwell said it Tuesday and I wrote it down. If we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always got. Cannot be business as usual. Something's got to touch us. Something's got to stir our faith. I said something has to stir our faith. I'm preaching to district superintendents. I want to ask you, when people come to your district conference this year, what are you going to tell them? Whenever you section presbyters call a sectional rally or conference in your area, when you bring them all together, what are you going to tell them? Is it going to be just a pizza party? Is it going to be just another fellowship? We're fellowship to death in the United Pentecostal Church. We are absolute professionals at getting together and scratching one another's back and shouting and weeping and crying and dancing with each other. What you going to tell them, Brother Presbyter? How about at Home Missions Board? When you commit, uh, whenever you put out your new missionaries this year, how about at Foreign Missions Division? When you go to the, to the Foreign Missions School of Missions, what you going to tell them when you get them there? How about it, Pastor? How about it, Leadership of the United Pentecostal Church? Brother Urshan, Brother Kilgore, Brother Williams, Brother Beckton, when we come together in Des Moines, Iowa, for our 50th Jubilee celebration, what you going to tell them? Oh God, something's got to get a hold of us. I said something's got to get a hold of us. Brother Urshan's been drilling at home to us at WEC. It seems like every time he preaches to us, every time he comes in and talks to us, it's a part of his message. He says, you get what you preach. And if anybody's responsible for what I'm preaching today, it's our bishop. He's been drilling us with this. You get what you preach. When you travel the fellowship, if you preach Jesus, if you lift him up, he's going to draw all men unto him. If you preach revival, you're going to get revival. If you preach growth, you're going to get growth. If you preach healing, and you're going to get healing. If you preach miracles, you're going to get miracles. If you preach deliverance and salvation, then that's what you're going to get. That's what the bishop's been telling us. You get what you preach. If that's true, then I want to know why are we getting in our pulpits and preaching messages on how dark the day is, how big the devil is, how evil the times are, what huge hurdles we have to clear in order to build a church in the 90s. Our, our church people live in that old dark world. They know how dark it is already. They don't need you and I to tell them again. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I present to you that the posture of the people of the United Pentecostal Church today is much the same as the Israelites in Numbers chapter 13. You listen careful to a boy that's been born and raised in the United Pentecostal Church. My mother brought me to church the first time when I was five days old. You could count on your fingers and toes the Sundays I've not been in church in my lifetime. This is all I know and forgive me, it's all I want to know. But let me tell you something about our fellowship. I believe that the United Pentecostal Church International is standing with bated breath waiting on marching orders for the end time. I believe there is an anticipation in our church. There is an excitement that is brewing. There is a hunger like I've never seen before. And I want to know, men and women of God, what are you going to tell them? (laughs) 
We need men and women of God that have faith and foresight. People that are able to declare without fear. People that are able to declare without hesitation that we are well able to take the land. We need men and women today like never before who are in tune with the Holy Ghost. We need men and women who has an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the church. And let me put an addendum on that. Who has a mouth that will speak what the Holy Ghost is saying to the church today. Now here's where I'm probably going to get in trouble. I've spoken to a lot of our elders. I've, I've checked with many of them. And many of them tell me that in their opinion, as a church, listen careful to what I'm fixing to tell you. As a church, we've stood here before. This isn't the first time there's been this kind of excitement. This isn't the first time we felt this deep drawing, Brother Barnes, of the Holy Ghost. This isn't the first time we've been called to a deeper life. This isn't the first time that God's promised us an apostolic revival in North America and around the world. We have stood at this juncture before as a church. Many of our elders will tell me of stories of what God did for us. Brother uh, Kilgore, you heard about it at the time of the merger. And then what God did for us at the time of the deeper life meetings and some of these other meetings that were so effective in our fellowship I'm too young to remember J.T. Pugh's evangelism commission but believe me since I've been home missions director I've received calls and letters from all over the fellowship men telling me what a great effect that evangelism commission had on the United Pentecostal Church Elder J.T. Pugh has been a Caleb he has been a Caleb to the United Pentecostal Church he has been one that all the way from back in the 60's he has cried out end time revival we're well able to take the land this is our day our time and our our hour. I never got to attend a deeper life meeting. I was only a little boy when those were going on. But I heard about how the Holy Ghost challenged our fellowship. I've heard the stories of G.A. and Vesta Mangan getting on their airplane and traveling from place to place to place during those deeper life meetings preaching about the Holy Ghost and prayer and fasting and end time revival. I remember as a little boy, my Uncle Bill coming home from Thailand, a hero in my eyes, traveling our fellowship, doing Holy Ghost rallies, and going into churches that hadn't had ten, get the Holy Ghost all year long, and in one Holy Ghost rally night, he would have ten and twenty and thirty and fifty in some places in one single night, filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Brother Billy Cole has been a pillar of faith. He's been a driving force behind apostolic revival for the United Pentecostal Church all these years. I thank God for the G.A. Mangans and the J.T. Pews and the N.A. Urshans and the James Kilgores and the Billy Coles that have not given up like Caleb of old. They've said, give me this mountain. I still believe we're well able to take the land. I'm going to say it and then I'm going to move on. Something happened in the 60s while the two were saying we can do it. The ten rose to their feet in force and shut us down. I don't know any nice way to say it. They didn't shut Caleb down, but they shut everybody else down. And my heart is grieved. My heart is grieved. Because I feel like. Just just allow me to say what I'm going to say and then I'll be out of your way. I believe we're standing in a prophetically charged place again. I believe that what we do or fail to do with the magnificent opportunities before us in 1995 will decide the eternal fate of multiplied tens of thousands. I believe that's what is hanging in the balances right now. Oh, God. We must not fail our generation. It's been said in this meeting, this can be our finest hour. Let me flip the coin over and tell you, it will either be our finest hour or our greatest hour of shame. It'll be one of the two. There is no middle 
ground. Either we'll cross Jordan or we'll stay on this side. There is no middle crown. Either Caleb and Joshua's voice will be heard and we'll all together say, yeah, it's our day, it's our hour, it's our time. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Please be seated. I ask you a question today with great respect for you. But this is my question. It comes from my heart. If we miss the opportunities that are laid at our doorsteps in 1995, when, if ever, will we pass this way again? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. And some of you is really not going to like it. But I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. God's going to have a church with you or without you. God's going to have a revival with us or without us. I've got scripture for that. There was one man that had to die before Israel could cross over. They're back at Jordan, but there's still one fellow alive. His name's Moses, and God had declared, you can't go in. And God took Moses to the top of the mountain. He said, Moses, look eastward, westward, northward, and southward. I want you to see the promised land that I promised. I want you to view it, but you're not going in. And I got news for you. There's a promised land with us or without us. There's a revival with us or without us. There's going to be a move of God with us or without us. But you're looking at one 350 pound boy that ain't got any intention of sitting on the sidelines. I intend to be in the middle of it. I said I'm going to be in the middle of what God's doing today. Oh my God, help us. God, help us. You may be seated. I genuinely believe that God, with all His mercy, has brought us to another place of opportunity. I believe that the people are gathering again. They're waiting for direction from us. You and I as pastors and leaders and evangelists in this fellowship, I believe they're suited up and they're ready to march. But they cannot and they will not go out and possess the land unless you and I sound a clear sound. What you going to tell them, Pastor? When you go home, what you going to tell them, Evangelist? When you go to your next revival, for the Superintendent, when you gather them together this spring, what you going to tell them? When Brother Urshan met our Pentecost Sunday committee, Brother Mike, Brother Anthony, you were there. He surprised all of us. I love Brother Urshan and I appreciate the vision that God's given him for this revival. But when Brother Urshan came in to meet us, he sat at the table, talked with us for a while just casually. And when it come time to open, I said, Brother Urshan, I want you to open the session and greet all these brethren. Talk to the men that have come in to discuss Pentecost Sunday. Brother Mark Foster, you were sitting right on the other side of us. The bishop leaned forward and he stunned everybody at the table because the first words out of his mouth, he said, Brethren, it's time to throw caution to the wind. That's not what you're used to hearing out of the bishop. That's not what you're used to hearing out of people who are in leadership. There is a responsibility that goes with the job that, that leans toward caution and care. But the bishop with tears streaming down his face. Oh, for all of you that are a part of the other ten, he wasn't talking about holiness. He wasn't talking about throwing away standards or doctrine. You heard what he preached last night. He's one God from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. I hugged his neck last night and said, Brother Urshan, I'm praying every day that God will give me a love and knowledge of the truth just like you got it. When he said, throw caution to the wind, he was talking about the day and the time and the hour that we live in. He was talking about the urgency of the day. He was talking about the responsibility of the apostolic church to reach a lost and dying world. Hear me, that's on its way to a devil's hell. Do you understand that? On its way to a devil's hell. 
Something's got to get a hold of us. I said something has got to get a hold of us. In that second chapter of Acts that we all love and hold so dear, we find 3,000 people gathered outside the upper room. They're listening, they're marveling, they're wondering about what they are hearing coming from the upper room. They hear 120 people speaking in other tongues and many of them speaking in their own tongue. And so questions come forth. Are these drunk? How is it we hear them in our own tongue? Some of them say, what meaneth this? This is another place in the scripture where thousands of Israelites stand with bated breath waiting for answers to their questions, direction for their lives, and spiritual revelation. I'm not sure you and I really understand how much faith it took on the part of the apostle Peter for him to step forward out of that 12. It's 11 to 1. He's all by himself. And brother Anthony Mangan, he reached back 400 years and got a hold of an old prophecy of Joel and he cried out, This is that! which was spoken by the prophet Joel. We go to our pulpits and we wimp around. Well, I don't want to go on record. I don't want anybody thinking I'm a date setter. I don't want anybody quoting me. I sure don't want this to go out on tape or video. I don't want anybody saying I've set dates, but I just think maybe someday we're going to have a move of God. A bunch of spiritual wimps. My God, it's time for somebody to get a hold of the boldness of the Apostle Peter and stand in their pulpit and say, Church, I've been away with God and I believe this is it. This is our day. It's our hour. It's our time. Oh, Shandalaboho Shekaralabahata. You say, Brother Cunningham, there's people that don't believe it. Let them believe whatever they want to believe. I'm telling you, it's time for Joshua and Caleb to get a hold of something like they've never had a hold of before and lift their voices up loud and don't allow the other ten to drown us out again. Those ten negative spies, they weren't the first and certainly not the last. In fact, if you read the history of the early church, you'll find out they had to contend with unbelievers in that church. Hello? Look what the scripture says, Acts 13 and 41. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish, is what he said. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. There are some folks aren't going to believe it. You tell them you had ten, get the Holy Ghost. All they can think about is compromising and charismatic and throw all kinds. You know why they put those tags on you? You hear what I'm telling you. Because they're not doing nothing. And if they can tear your something down to nothing, it makes them feel okay. I beg of you, I beg of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm appealing to the United Pentecostal Church International, don't let the negative voice of the ten drown out the faith of the Joshuas and the Calebs. This is our day. Not only is this our day, it may very well be our last opportunity. I don't know what that does to you. There's something inside of me, Brother Barnes, that says I want to be a part of it more than I want anything else in this life. I want to be a part of what God's doing in this day. 1995 is going to be the greatest year in the history of the United Pentecostal Church. I didn't say might be, maybe, could be, should be. I'm telling you, God Almighty has declared that if you and I is ready to cross over, there's revival for this church, a revival like we've never seen or dreamed of before. The Holy Ghost is being poured out in our day like never before in history. 
Kila Bahashata. You may be seated. I'm going to tell you it is not a coincidence. Turn to your neighbor and say it's not a coincidence. It is not a coincidence that this is our 50th year. It is not a coincidence that this is our jubilee anniversary for the United Pentecostal Church. At 2 o'clock this morning I turned my computer on and I looked up the word jubilee in the American Heritage Dictionary. It says a season or an occasion of joyful celebration. Jubilation, rejoicing. In the Hebrew Scriptures it says it's observed by the Israelites every 50th year during which slaves were to be set free and alienated property restored to the former owners and the lands left untilled. Listen to this preacher. It's not a coincidence that in our 50th year God is talking to so many leaders and God is touching hearts of spiritual men and women and letting us know this can be our jubilee year if we'll let it. Now I'm going to wade in just a little deeper here, Brother Anthony. Listen to what I'm telling you. I was praying over one month ago. I began to seek God about this service, about the responsibility of standing before you. I do not take it lightly. And as clear as I'm speaking to you, God spoke to my heart over one month ago and let me know that because of the times 1995 can be the catalyst, it can be the launching pad, something can get a hold of us in this meeting. Our minds can be changed this week. Our attitudes can be altered this week. The Holy Ghost spoke to me and let me know know that if you and I are very conscious of what the Spirit is saying to the church and we do not miss the opportunity that we can leave the because of the times 1995 and go back to our towns and our churches and have the greatest year of revival that the church has ever had. This United Pentecostal Church that you and I belong to, something powerful, something wonderful is happening to us. As I said, I've been around this church all my life, but I don't mind telling you I have never seen or felt what I'm feeling today in our church. I've never felt the excitement. I've never felt the unity. I've never felt the prayer. I've never felt the faith. I've never felt revival. I've never felt anticipation like I'm feeling it today among God's people. There are preachers that it is getting into their mind and into their heart and they are beginning to say yeah this could be it they're beginning to say it could be our day they're beginning to say this is our time and I'm telling you that's all God's waiting for is somebody to have the faith to stand up and declare that you believe it In 1995, right here in North America, we were about to embark upon the largest home Bible study, soul-winning campaign ever launched in the history of the United Pentecostal Church. We are looking for more than 10,000 Bible studies to be taught in the next three months or the three months preceding June the 4th, 1995. Every church, every pastor that I've talked to in North America is uniting together under the banner of Pentecost Sunday, 1995. And we are all believing that a minimum of 10,000 people are going to be filled with the Holy Ghost on June the 4th, 1995. Brother Billy Cole's been going to Ethiopia and in the last three years I believe I heard him say this week more than a hundred thousand people have been filled with the Holy Ghost in Ethiopia in the last three years and I want to go on record as saying I believe it I believe every one of them got it and probably more. They're getting the Holy Ghost in El Salvador. There's a great revival in Mexico. There's revival in Asia and parts of Africa. There's revival around our world. But there's something in my heart, and I believe it's alive in your heart too, that says, God, if you can do it in Ethiopia, we want it right here in North America. God, if you can do it in El Salvador, we've got to have it here in the United States. God, if you can give us revival in Mexico, don't overlook North America. Something's fixing to happen to the North American church. It has, be, it has become 
solidified in our mind. It's a paradigm that we have to contend with. And that is that thousands can get it on the foreign field, but not here in the United States. That thousands can come to God somewhere around the world, but it can't happen in our land. I'm here to tell you God's fixing to smash that block wall to pieces. He's fixing to crush it below our feet. God's fixing to show us that if we unite together, if we express our faith in where we are and what He's doing, He's going to pour out His Spirit upon thousands right here in the United States. And I'm closing. I I thank God for the United Pentecostal Church. I wouldn't trade it for anything in this whole wide world. Feel sorry for folks that aren't in it. I love this church. But let me tell you something about our church. Come June 5th, one day after Pentecost Sunday, we're going to all belong to a new United Pentecostal Church. Because we're going toe-to-toe with some traditions. And toe-to-toe with some, with some old mindsets and paradigms and restrictions and negative thinking that says it can't be done in our land. And when the numbers all come together and the report is printed that 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 got the Holy Ghost in one day right here in North America, I'm here to tell you our church will never be the same again. I want you to put both hands in the air and I want you to cry out. God, I believe this is it. I believe it's our day. I believe it's our hour. In the book of Jude, it says, Praying in the Holy Ghost, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. I want every hand in the air, and I want everybody to begin praying in the Holy Ghost right now. It's going to happen. It's happening right now. It's happening. God, doctor our minds. God, work on our minds. Work on our hearts. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost Church. Pray in the Holy Ghost Church. Pray in the Holy Ghost. He dava ho shekara bahando da mahaya. He koro da 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 bahando da da mahataya. He koro da 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 bahando da da mahataya. Halaba ho sheheti ando da da mahaya. He dava ho shekara bahando. He koro da da bahando da mahaya. He koro da da bahando. Let me have your attention just for a second. I want you to say some names out loud in prayer. We're going to pray. I want you to speak the name of our general superintendent, N.A. Ershin, out loud in prayer in a moment. I want you to call the name of C.M. Becton and James Kilgore that just preached so beautifully and powerfully to us. I want you to call the name of Jesse Williams. I want you to call the name of Harry Sism that has the responsibility of leading us in reaching the remainder of the world. Four-fifths of the world lives away from us. Listen to me, friend. There is a responsibility, but our God is able. If God said He was going to do it we don't need to doubt it one more minute we need to get a hold of it we need to blast it from the rooftops that we believe God I want you to add to that the name of your district superintendent. I want you to call his name in prayer. And then I want you to add the name of your presbyter. I want you to go right down the line. You say, Brother Cunningham, I may be the one that needs prayer, not my leadership. You reap what you sow. If you'll call on God right now to anoint and bless your leadership, there's going to be people at home tonight, Wednesday night Bible study. They're going to say, Pastor's not here. He's down it because of the times. And a bunch of precious saints are going to put their hands in the air. And they're 
you're going to say, God, speak to my preacher this week. God, touch my pastor this week. Put your hands in the air and pray for your leadership. Call their name out in prayer. Call their name out in prayer. God, I thank you for Brother Urshan. I want you to let your anointing and direction be upon him. Thank you for Brother Becton. Thank you for Brother Kilgore. Thank you for Brother Williams. Thank you for Brother Harry Sism. I thank you for my superintendent, Brother Dunlap. I thank you for my presbyter, Brother Robert Hall. I want you to give them direction. I want you to give them anointing. I want you to give them power. I want you to give them faith. I thank Thank you for my uncle, Brother Billy Cole, and the inspiration he is on my life. I want you to strengthen his body. I want you to anoint him greater than he's ever been anointed before. He Ever since I was a little boy, and I'm done. Ever since I was a little boy, there's one man that has been known as a prophet among us. This man has declared more years than I've been alive that it's going to happen. This is it. I heard him say it this morning. Brother Barnes grabbed the microphone today and he walked out here and said, This is it. This is our day. I want him to come and pray for you. You've just prayed for your leadership. I want you to come out here, Brother Barnes, and I want you to pray for this audience. I want you to look at the beautiful men and women that are here. We're just waiting on marching orders. We're ready to go. Well, the old prophet said it. At evening time, there shall be light. We heard it just now. I never heard anything like it. Touch me. I'm stirred up. Amen. I wish I was 21. I'd ask for revival. Be going with you. But now, when God said there shall be light, there will be light. I believe this is the people the Lord wants to give that light to. And He's doing it. We're closing this service today in faith believing. I don't believe we're just talking. There's the Holy Ghost talking here. Amen, amen. We just start trying to say something, get you all built up. The Holy Ghost is in this place. The Holy Ghost is here. I want you to put your hands up. We're going to pray for revival all over this nation and all over the world. And believe it. It's here. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of faith today that's poured out upon our souls. Here we stand. Believe in you for the great revival. The great revival is here. And we shall cross over Jordan. We shall see it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's coming. It's coming. I close with one statement here. The nine spiritual gifts is not given to run the church with, but to bless it. The fivefold ministry is placed in the church, and you are part of that today. And God has chosen to run the church, to move the church into end time revival through the fivefold ministry. Let's get with it in Jesus' name. Let's go.